The laughter started as a ripple, a light giggle that caught me off guard. I remember clutching my side, the kind of involuntary joy that comes when something is absurd beyond explanation. But halfway through that laugh, my vision fractured, like glass cracking under sudden pressure, and the sound stuck in my throat. I felt my knees buckle before I even realized I was falling. The world tilted, slow and syrupy, yet mercilessly fast. My hands reached for anything, someone's arm, the edge of a chair, but the connection slipped. I hit the floor, still hearing the faint echo of my own laughter turning into gasps. The fluorescent hospital lights above me blurred into white halos. I was dimly aware of voices, urgent, panicked, snapping into motion. Footsteps, metal trays rattling, a nurse calling for a crash cart. It didn't make sense. I hadn't been sick. I hadn't been anything, just laughing. Then the laughter was gone. In its place came a crushing stillness, a heavy void pressing against the inside of my skull. My body refused commands. I wanted to tell them I was fine, that I could breathe, but my jaw wouldn't open. My mind screamed silently while my eyes darted, trapped in their sockets. The last thing I saw before the world went black was the expression on the doctor's face. Eyes wide, brows drawn, his lips forming the words, This... this doesn't make sense. That sentence would haunt me later, when I learned what they found lodged deep inside the frontal lobe of my brain. My name is Emily Carter, and until that day, I believed laughter was the safest form of medicine. I was 34, a graphic designer from Portland, Oregon, living what I thought was a perfectly ordinary life. I had no history of seizures, no chronic illness, no reason to believe my own body could turn against me without warning. The incident happened during a casual work lunch. A coworker told a ridiculous story, something about an intern in a runaway office chair. The table erupted. I laughed along, tipping back in my seat, until that strange, jagged feeling swept through my head. Seconds later, I was unconscious, sprawled on the cafeteria floor. What made my case so bizarre was the speed and severity of the collapse. There was no gradual dizziness, no chest pain, no shortness of breath, just laughter and blackout. The ER team initially suspected fainting from hyperventilation, but routine tests didn't explain the sudden paralysis that followed. My vitals were stable, my heart rhythm was normal, but I couldn't move or speak for hours. As the hours turned into days, my medical team realized this was far from a simple fainting spell. Something in my brain had misfired in a way they hadn't seen before. Something that froze both my muscles and my voice, while keeping me painfully conscious. It was terrifying, but it was only the beginning. The next weeks would unravel a mystery hidden in plain sight, buried in the folds of my frontal lobe. And as much as this story is about medicine, it's also about the raw, human fear of losing control over your own body. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that like button, and comment below telling us what country and city you're watching from. In the days following my collapse, the hospital room became my world. A soft beeping from the monitor at my bedside was the only sound I trusted. I could move again, slowly, but something felt off. My reactions lagged as if my body was buffering before responding. The nurses called it residual neurological latency, which sounded too clinical for the strange, detached sensation I felt when I tried to lift my hand or turn my head. Dr. Patel, the neurologist assigned to my case, was methodical. She began each morning with the same battery of tests. Reflex hammer taps, like tracking with her pen, word recall drills. I could answer, but sometimes the right word would float just out of reach. It's mild aphasia, she explained gently, scribbling notes. Could be temporary, could be a sign of something deeper. At first, the team suspected a transient ischemic attack, a mini-stroke brought on by some hidden vascular weakness. My MRI, however, came back clean. No clot, no bleeding, no visible trauma. The absence of answers only heightened the tension in the room. I could see it in their posture, in the way Dr. Patel leaned closer to the monitor, scanning for anomalies as if the pixels might suddenly confess. My family visited daily. My mother tried to keep her voice light, but I caught her wiping her eyes when she thought I was sleeping. My younger brother, Jake, avoided sitting too close, almost as if he feared I was contagious. Their unease mirrored my own. I wanted them to believe I was improving, but each time I tried to stand for longer than a minute, a wave of disorientation washed over me. Day four brought the first of the micro laughs, as I started calling them. They came without context, a tiny burst of chuckle escaping my lips, sometimes while I was completely alone. They weren't joyful, they felt mechanical, like my brain had pressed the wrong button. Dr. Patel's eyebrows knitted when I told her. That's... unusual, she admitted, jotting the words down with deliberate care. The EEG was next. A cap studded with electrodes clung to my scalp, wires feeding into a machine that translated my brain's electrical chatter into jagged lines on a screen. During the test, the technician asked me to recall a happy memory. Halfway through describing a childhood camping trip, I erupted into another of those dissonant giggles, sharp, sudden, unprovoked. The technician froze, then made a note. 
Later that evening, Dr. Patel returned with preliminary EEG results. We're seeing atypical activity in the prefrontal cortex, she explained, tracing a finger along a spike in the readout. This is the part of your brain that manages higher cognitive functions and also regulates emotional responses. Something is triggering laughter without the corresponding emotional context. Her words settled in my stomach like ice. That night, sleep was elusive. My mind kept replaying the collapse, the blur of white lights, the way my body betrayed me mid-laugh. I thought about the hundreds of times I'd laughed in my life without a second thought. Now each chuckle felt like a loaded gun, unpredictable and potentially dangerous. On the sixth day, Dr. Patel ordered a functional MRI, one that could observe brain activity in real time. She wanted to see what happened when I laughed. I sat in the machine, headphones delivering a series of audio clips meant to evoke humor. The result was immediate and disturbing. My prefrontal cortex lit up violently on the screen while my emotional centers remained dormant. This isn't a mood disorder, Dr. Patel concluded the next morning, her tone edged with something between fascination and concern. This is neurological. There's a structural or functional anomaly here, and we're going to find it. Her determination was reassuring, but I couldn't ignore the undercurrent in her voice. She was intrigued because this was rare, maybe even unprecedented. I was no longer just a patient. I was a case study. The first sign that things were getting worse came on the ninth day. I was halfway through breakfast, a bland hospital oatmeal, when my right hand simply refused to obey. The spoon slipped from my fingers, clattering against the tray. At first, I thought it was fatigue, but then my forearm twitched involuntarily, a sharp jerking spasm that sent a shiver through me. Dr. Patel arrived within minutes, her expression tight. Transient motor loss, she said, testing my grip strength. I could squeeze, but there was a split second delay between the command in my mind and the actual movement. It's subtle, she admitted, but in combination with the laughter episodes, it points towards something progressive. That afternoon, the micro laughs escalated into full, uncontrolled bursts. They came without warning, loud, sharp peals of laughter that echoed in my sterile room. The sound felt alien, as if my mouth were producing it, but my mind wasn't in on the joke. The nurses tried to mask their discomfort, but I saw them exchange uneasy glances each time it happened. By day 11, the headaches began. They weren't constant, but when they came, they were crushing, concentrated deep in the front of my skull, as if someone were pressing a thumb directly into my brain. Painkillers dulled them, but the relief was temporary. I started dreading their arrival more than the laughter itself. The hospital initiated a 24-hour observation protocol. I was moved into a room closer to the nurse's station, wired to continuous EEG and cardiac monitoring. At 3 a.m., a particularly violent episode woke me. My body convulsed in laughter for nearly 30 seconds straight, tears streaming down my face while my heart rate spiked dangerously high. Dr. Patel reviewed the episode's data with me the next morning. The prefrontal hyperactivity is spreading, she said, showing me a side-by-side -side of my brain scans from the first week versus now. The abnormal electrical surges were not confined anymore. They were creeping toward the motor cortex. If this continues, she warned, it could start affecting basic motor control and possibly speech permanently. My family's visits grew more tense. Jake tried to make me laugh on purpose, as if proving it wasn't dangerous, but when a short, involuntary giggle slipped out, my mother flinched. I felt like a loaded weapon in my own skin, unpredictable and unsafe. Conversations grew shorter, full of awkward pauses and half-finished sentences. On the 15th day, the first blackout since my initial collapse struck. I was speaking to a nurse when my vision tunneled, my knees gave way, and I woke up three hours later with no memory of the fall. This time, there was no laughter preceding it, just an abrupt switch from consciousness to nothingness. The incident triggered a cascade of additional tests, high-resolution MRI, PET scan, lumbar puncture. Each came back maddeningly inconclusive. No tumors, no infection, no vascular malformations. Yet the electrical storms in my brain were intensifying. It's like your brain is running a program we can't see, Dr. Patel said quietly, and it's starting to take over the system. By the end of the month, I could feel the change in myself. My emotions dulled as if wrapped in gauze. Laughter, once a reflex of joy, had become a warning siren. Every time it erupted without cause, I felt another piece of control slip away. I realized then this wasn't just about finding a diagnosis. It was about racing against whatever was rewiring me from the inside. It was on the 21st day that Dr. Patel walked into my room with a different kind of energy, tighter, more urgent. She didn't bother with small talk. We're bringing in a specialist, she said. Neuro-oncology. There's something we might have overlooked. The word oncology made my stomach knot, but her tone suggested this wasn't a typical cancer scare. That afternoon, Dr. Luis Romero arrived. He was quiet, deliberate, the kind of doctor who listened longer than he spoke. After reviewing my scans, he asked to repeat the functional MRI, but this time with a new protocol that targeted microvascular anomalies in the frontal lobe. I agreed, my pulse thudding in my ears. The scan took over an hour. 
I lay still as the machine whirred, the technician feeding me a mix of emotional and neutral stimuli. Some images were funny, others deeply sad. Yet my brain reacted inconsistently, massive surges during irrelevant moments, silence when genuine humor appeared. It was like my emotional wiring had been scrambled. Back in the consultation room, Dr. Romero pointed at a faint shadow on the frontal lobe image. It's small, he said, zooming in, but this isn't supposed to be here. It wasn't a tumor in the traditional sense, more like an irregular cluster of tissue, pressing ever so slightly on neural pathways that regulated emotion and motor control. Dr. Patel leaned in. A cortical hamartoma, she explained. Benign in most cases, but in your brain's exact location, it could explain everything. The inappropriate laughter, the motor delays, even the blackouts. The pressure disrupts normal signaling, creating electrical storms in your prefrontal cortex. Relief washed over me at first, finally a name for the enemy, but it quickly gave way to fear. If something physical was lodged in my brain, it meant surgery was the only real fix. Dr. Romero confirmed my suspicion. Medication might control symptoms, but it won't stop progression. The episodes will likely get worse. They scheduled a stereotactic biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. The procedure was delicate, using imaging to guide a needle into the brain to retrieve a tissue sample. Lying on the operating table, head secured in a frame, I felt a surreal detachment, as if I were watching someone else's life unfold from above. The results came two days later. Confirmed cortical hamartoma, low growth rate, but with an unusually high level of neural integration. In other words, it was tangled into my brain's wiring like roots gripping stone. Surgical removal is possible, Dr. Romero said, but risky. We're dealing with a command center for movement and emotion. That night, alone in my hospital bed, I weighed the options. Live with unpredictable seizures of laughter, blackouts, and gradual loss of control, or gamble with brain surgery that could leave me speechless, paralyzed, or worse. It wasn't a decision you make lightly, and yet the ticking clock inside my skull didn't allow for hesitation. The turning point came the next morning when I experienced my longest episode yet, over a minute of uncontrollable convulsive laughter that left me gasping for air. Dr. Patel's hand gripped mine when it finally stopped. This is accelerating, she said quietly. If we wait, we may lose the window for a safe surgery. And in that moment, my decision was made. Surgery was scheduled for the following Tuesday. The days leading up to it felt suspended in amber. Every minute stretched thin, heavy with anticipation. Dr. Patel and Dr. Romero explained the plan repeatedly, ensuring I understood the stakes. We'll perform a frameless stereotactic resection, Dr. Romero said, tracing the path on a 3D model of my brain. The goal is to excise the hamartoma with minimal disruption to surrounding tissue. The word minimal was doing a lot of work. Preoperative prep began two days early. Blood work, additional MRIs, and endless consent forms that listed complications in cold legal language. Speech loss, paralysis, infection, death. I signed each one with a trembling hand. My mother hovered in the corner, gripping a rosary she hadn't used in years. Jake paced, muttering half-formed reassurances neither of us believed. The morning of the surgery, the OR lights were blindingly white. I was awake for the initial phase. My skull numbed with local anesthetic, so they could monitor brain function in real time. We need you talking during part of the procedure. Dr. Patel reminded me, her voice steady but soft. It helps us avoid damaging critical pathways. As the drill whirred and the bone flap was lifted, I focused on the sound of my own voice, reciting the alphabet, naming objects on flashcards, answering simple math questions. Then came the laughter, unprovoked, uncontrollable, bubbling up mid-sentence. The surgical team exchanged glances, but Dr. Romero's eyes lit with grim recognition. We're close, he murmured. Navigating through my frontal lobe was like threading a needle inside a spider's web. Every millimeter mattered. The hamartoma revealed itself as a pale, rubbery mass entwined with delicate neural fibers. Removing it required severing some connections, calculated risks that might alter my personality or motor skills. Each cut felt like a silent gamble. Midway through, my right hand twitched violently and my speech faltered. Pause, Dr. Patel ordered. They adjusted their trajectory, shifting slightly away from a motor strip. My words returned, shaky but intact. The room exhaled in unison. It was a reminder that every second in that theater carried consequences measured in the rest of my life. After nearly six hours, Dr. Romero announced the hamartoma was out. I remember a surreal stillness. No more involuntary laughter, no phantom giggle clawing at my throat. They irrigated the site, sealed the opening, and replaced the bone flap. The anesthesiologist deepened my sedation, and the world dissolved into black. I woke in the ICU to the rhythmic hiss of a ventilator and the distant beeping of monitors. My head felt like it had been filled with cement, every thought sluggish and heavy. 
Dr. Patel appeared at my bedside. You came through beautifully, she said, but her eyes scanned my face for subtle deficits, drooping, a symmetry, hesitation in my gaze. Initial tests were promising. I could move all my limbs, my speech was coherent, and most strikingly, there was no sign of inappropriate laughter. Still, they warned me, recovery would be a long and even road. Swelling, fatigue, and cognitive glitches were expected. The brain doesn't like being rearranged. Dr. Romero quipped gently, though his eyes betrayed deep relief. That night, alone under the ICU's dim lights, I felt both victorious and fragile. The mass was gone, but the fear lingered. What if something of me had been left on that surgical table? What if the laughter came back? I closed my eyes and whispered a promise to myself. If I'd been given another chance, I'd find a way to make every second count. The first morning after surgery, I woke to a strange silence inside my head. For weeks, there had been an undercurrent of electrical chaos, a restless hum that seemed to live just beneath my thoughts. Now it was gone. My mind felt still, as if someone had closed a window that had been rattling in the wind for too long. Recovery began in small, deliberate steps. A physical therapist named Carla visited my room twice a day, guiding me through gentle movements, turning my head, flexing my hands, shifting my weight from one foot to the other. Each motion carried a new awareness, a gratitude for control I'd once taken for granted. The laughter episodes had vanished completely, but they'd left behind a deep wariness. Whenever someone cracked a joke, I hesitated, afraid to let my guard down. Humor, once effortless, now felt like a test I might fail. Dr. Patel encouraged me to trust my body again, reminding me that the trigger had been removed. Cognitive rehab was more challenging. I had minor delays in word recall and sometimes lost my train of thought mid-sentence. Speech therapists worked with me on memory exercises, timing me as I named objects or recited sequences of numbers. These lapses were frustrating, but each day I noticed small improvements. Fewer pauses, quicker responses. Emotionally, the transformation was harder to measure. Before the surgery, I'd lived in a state of constant tension, bracing for the next unpredictable episode. Now, that tension was replaced by an acute awareness of my own fragility. I felt both stronger and more vulnerable, as if I had been rebuilt from thinner glass. My family became my anchor. My mother cooked meals I could eat without effort, filling the house with familiar smells. Jake started driving me to appointments, always checking the rearview mirror to see if I was smiling. Their presence grounded me, reminding me that this ordeal had touched them too. At my six-week follow-up, Dr. Patel reviewed my latest scans. No residual mass, no abnormal activity, she said, smiling for the first time without reservation. She placed the images side by side, before and after, and the difference was stark. Where there had once been a shadow in my frontal lobe, there was now clear, healthy tissue. I began to reclaim the parts of life I'd paused, returning to my graphic design projects, meeting friends for coffee, walking through the city without the constant fear of collapse. The simplest moments felt amplified, sunlight on my face, the hum of conversation in a crowded cafe, the sound of my own laugh, now entirely mine again. The hospital later asked if I'd be willing to share my case at a neurology conference. Standing on that stage months later, I recounted my story, how a laugh had unraveled my life and how a team of determined doctors had stitched it back together. The applause was warm, but what stayed with me were the faces of the young residents listening intently, maybe seeing the human side of their future work. In the end, this wasn't just about surviving a rare neurological condition, it was about redefining what survival meant. I walked away with a scar hidden beneath my hairline and a deeper understanding of how fragile and miraculous the brain truly is. And now, when I laugh, it's with full awareness of the gift it is. A sound not of danger, but of life reclaimed. Looking back, it's hard to believe that something as simple as laughter could have been both my enemy and my salvation. The very symptom that nearly stole my autonomy was also the clue that led my doctors to the truth. It taught me that the body speaks in ways we don't always understand, and that listening, really listening, can make the difference between decline and recovery. I carry no resentment for the months lost to fear and uncertainty. Instead, I see them as a strange apprenticeship in resilience. My family's unwavering presence, the dedication of my medical team, and my own determination to keep asking why, these became the architecture of my survival. The scar on my scalp is barely visible now, but in my mind, it's a permanent reminder that life can change in a heartbeat, and that every moment of clarity is worth cherishing. If my story has shown you anything, I hope it's this. The line between the ordinary and the extraordinary is often invisible until it's crossed. Join us next time when we explore another case that defied medical logic and pushed the limits of human endurance. You won't want to miss it.